So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your patience. I believe the previous session took a bit longer. And so we wanted to give all of you the opportunity to have a short coffee break. But now we're ready to get started with our afternoon session, focusing on the future of travel, e-ticketing, smartphones and data sharing. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not that tech savvy. I have used my smartphone uh, already many times to download my boarding pass, for example, when I'm flying somewhere. Um, some of you probably use smart cards um, for ticketing, traveling on mostly local uh, and uh, public transport in certain regions, which are mostly limited. So one question, of course, is how can uh, this public transport be more cross-border and seamless? And this is exactly what we would like to focus on in the next 90 minutes, focusing on the opportunities, risks, innovation and information technologies are bringing to public transport. And uh, so that all of you can sh uh, participate in this session, we have headsets. I hope you all have them already. If not, then just go outside. One of our hostesses will surely be able to hand a headset uh, to you. We have six languages translated for you. I would like to start with a short introduction round with opening remarks from all the panelists. Then we will have a discussion, which I uh, very soon, would like to open up for questions from the floor. We have microphones standing here, so if you just give me a sign, raise your arm that you would like to ask a question or make a comment, that is welcome too, then I will leave it to you. Now, let me first introduce the panelists to you. Uh, over there on my far right is uh, Pedro Pablo Erasuris, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. He's the Minister of Transport and Telecommunications in Chile. Welcome. Then uh, there is Mr. Scott, Scott Belcher, CEO Intelligent Transportation Society, in short, ITS of America. Good afternoon to you. Uh, next to him is uh, Mr. Mitsuo Higashi. He's the Director of the International Department, East Japan Railway Company. To my left is Tom Brenner, Vice President, Nokia Applications. Next to him is Mr. Yongbuk Park, Vice President, Smart Card Company Korea. And to my far left, John Verity, Chief Advisor, ITSO Limited, that is the UK Transport Smart Card Organization. So now that we know who we are dealing with, I would like to start with uh, Minister Era Suris. And perhaps you could tell us how you understand the role of government um, to facilitate integration of ticketing between various modes and public transport operators. What's your experience in that field so far? Well, I would like to, to address that question by showing you a little bit of information of a project that, although was supposed to be very successful, had many failures but has good news for our uh, smartphones, data sharing, or IT in general, because uh, one of the things that was very well uh, perceived by population was actually the use of, the, the use of no money, but cards, automatic cards. And, and I would like to show you that first by uh, bringing a small uh, summary on what Chile is. Chile is a country in South America, after I finish, you can say that you knew about this, but this, is, this will give you the, the, the... It's a small country, it's thin and long. It has all type of weather, it's very dry desert in the north, very cold areas down south. It has a population of 17.2 million inhabitants. The GDP is 232,000 million US dollars, and this means 13.5 thousand dollars per person. It's a country divided in, in 15 regions, out of which the main one is the metropolitan area, where uh, I would say one third of the, of the population lives. We uh, decided to improve the transportation system in Chile. We had uh, what we called yellow buses, and it was a system run mainly by the owners of the buses, and it was about 12,000 buses in the city, old buses, ugly, noisy, running all around the city. 
And we had the idea to go from high pollution system to be the best in Latin America. We ha had a high congestion system and we wanted fewer buses. We had a high rate of accidents and we wanted to reduce them. We had informal labor force and we wanted fully paid with the social security in place for the drivers. And the only thing that we were seeing to be a loss was that we had a point-to-point -point system where a person would give, get onto a bus, drive, uh, go for one and a half hours and finish in their destination. We knew that the solution to reduce buses and to increase the, the productivity was to have uh, feeders and mains so that we would need to have stopovers. Out of these things were all well uh, planned and, and, and managed, and, and actually most of them really happened. The, the pollution, we actually reduced them substantially, and now we are actually the best in Latin America in terms of having a system that is very clean. We actually have fewer buses, but we did it in, in one big bang, so every, everything failed. And one of the most impor important failures were that we assumed that no subsidy was needed to run the system. That doing all these changes could be done with the same amount of money. And to do that, the design assumed that you could do it with less than 5,000 buses. And that meant high speeds higher than what the city allows. And what happened was that we needed more than 6,000 buses, and therefore we needed subsidies. And big subsidies to what Chile was used to. Actually, when the system started, millions of passengers had to walk to their jobs. Actually, millions of passengers had to walk to their jobs. And we had a terrible image for the system. And that image, which was five years ago, has been almost impossible to recover. Even after big improvements, we still have a terrible image for the system. Um, it's so bad the image that whenever someone wants to, to pray that he's not going to have a bad project, says, I hope that this is not a new Transantiago, which is the name of the transport system in Santiago. So that's, a, and this is used for ministers, for everyone. Everyone that has a new project says, I hope this is not a Transantiago project. Just to refer that it's not a failure. To be even more, pessimistic on, on what the uh, situation is. You see here, uh, we rank, uh, we grade things from one to seven, and you see on the top how people rank, sorry. One second. How people rank, the, this is 4.2 average, so almost pass, because four is to pass. It's just above passing, and if you see the service of buses is even worse, if you take the image of the system, 3.7, so it doesn't pass. And this is today, after five years. If you, if you see the, the routes, it's a, a little bit above pass, although the routes are today twice as big as that, what they were be, before this new system. We have the value of the system to be very, very bad also. We have a stop, a bus stops very low, is 4.4, although we have we had 1,000 stops with roof before. Now we have 7,000 stops with roof. Still, the people think that it's a very bad system. Uh, we have infrastructure to be weak. We have the metro, which is one of the, the fifth. It, it, it was ranked among the, fi the five top one in the world. But still, people feel that it's not, uh, well, it's better than everything else but still not too good. And I skip one, and I skip the use of cards. This is the only thing that people see to be very good. So where everything is perceived to be very bad, although it's actually much better than what we had before, the use of cards rather than money to pay in buses is perceived to be very good. And, and this is actually, I think, a very satisfying uh, for all of us that have been working on having systems to, to improve the transport system using more IT. 
And uh, although we have a, a lot to do and it's hard to change the image of the system in Chile, we have very good news when it comes to use of IT systems to improve the, 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 the efficiency of the system. I really wanted to point this out to show you a little bit on, on what happened with a real, really uh, bad project, the way we implemented it, but still very good news about the use of IT systems whenever, uh, even when, when you have a bad project like this. Okay, well thank you very much. So this, this was a trial and error project um, and uh, the uh, IT helps you now hopefully to turn around the image slowly but surely. Uh, Mr. Belcher, uh, Intelligent Transportation Society of America, how is this intelligent technology changing the option travelers have nowadays? Well, I think um, just to pivot off of the minister's uh, comments, uh, technology is, um, is starting to provide new options to people who are traveling um, and, and, and providing uh, us the ability to leverage the transportation system that we have. I put up on this slide just a series of um, just different companies that represent different opportunities that we're seeing today. Uh, for example, you can go on uh, to Google Transit or one of the state-run, um, state or locally run um, transit systems, and you can get an opportunity to, to compare driving from point A to point B with taking transit. And it'll give you the directions, it'll tell you how long the bus or the train is going to take, and how long it'll take you to move from one mode to another, so that users can make informed decisions about whether to, um, to use transit and whether transit's a viable option or whether to use their car. Even if they choose to use their car, technology is providing a variety of new options about, uh, about the use of a car. Um, you have companies like Avego or Carpool, iCarpool, which um, provide users the opportunity to um, to, to, to ride share or to rent a seat in a car that's going to the same direction. These are opportunities for lower income people, they're opportunities for younger people, they're opportunities for many of us who would prefer not to drive their own car with one occupant but to have two or three occupants. And in fact in, in many states in the United States today I can rent my car if I want to and, and still be secure that it will be insured and, and, and get some income when I'm not using it. There are also um, new, new technologies that are making uh, renting cars by the hour um, viable. A company called Zipcar in the United States, there's Buzz in France, um, and even the automobile manufacturers are getting into the business. You've got companies like Daimler's car to go for example, which within, within the Daimler, the Mercedes-Benz uh, owner uh, uh, pool, you can uh, car share there as well. And it kind of represents how technology is transforming the way we think. To think of an automobile manufacturer that's really all about selling cars is now creating an opportunity where you can share cars. The last thing I would talk about is, is that there are companies like Nokia, like Inrex, like Garmin, that are providing state-of-the-art, um, real-time traffic information. So there are um, state governments like the Michigan Department of Transportation that do the same thing. The new thing that's being added to that um, that, that I think is fascinating is, is a company like Waze. Waze is a company that basically takes the traveler information system that you've got and then it overlays on that um, a network of people. So you, if, you're, if you're driving in real time and you come across a crash and you let your network know about that crash, you can be rerouted around the crash. And then the, the final thing that makes it even more exciting, maybe not for the audience here because you all look a little too old, but for my 17 year old, <laughs> um, there's a gaming system on top of it. And so you can, you can gain points by participating in this and then you can get discounts at Starbucks, you can get all kinds of different things. You can beat your partner or you can beat your friends by, by using the system more. And the more you use the system, the better the data becomes and the more opportunities people have. So these are just some of the examples that technology is, is using to change the way we, we view transportation. 
Well, there was certainly uh, that remark, that very charming remark uh, you just made to our to our audience here, uh, is one point that I would like to uh, explore later a bit more in detail, whether all these new technologies are really something for the next generation, uh, if people like us can still keep up with it. Uh, but perhaps Mr. Uh, Tom Brenner, Vice President of Nokia Applications, could... Uh, Tell us, first of all, I mean, you are one of the companies Mr. Uh, Belcher just referred to who are sort of like outsiders to the transport industry, but you help reshape it one way or the other. Why would a uh, communications company want to do that? Yeah, so so maybe let me let me start off and get back to the questions basically at the end of the, of the presentation because it, it might get answered. Um, um, and you know, I, I'm I'm coming in with a completely different angle, right? I, I'm coming in from the communications angle, and it's kind of interesting that your role is basically a combination of uh, of, of two things, right? Transport and communication. And we had um, we had you know a phase of mobilizing communications um, within the last 20 years. It's mobilizing landlines, so you have a mobile phone, you can take calls everywhere. We had the phase of mobilizing, um, you know, internet access, information access, which is just coming, you know, in the emerged countries. Um, we have it pretty broadly in the emerging countries. You know, it's it's starting up. And what we think the next very interesting thing to look at is actually looking at the combination of the two, transport and mobility in the real world, com combined with communication and information access. And this this is what we call the where phase, and we just labeled it that way because it's all about, you know, what's happening out there um, in the in the real world. And if you look at um, a little bit, you know, very simple questions, where can we meet at 6 p.m.? You know, this is what people do in their everyday life. What time will I need to leave to get to work today? Today, not in general. When do I get home from here? Um, they sound really simple. Right, but when do I get home from here means you need to know, you need to feed the system um, with the position you're at. You need to ask it, right? You need to take into account basically the time of the day, the available transport methods to give an answer to that. And this is what we're thinking through from a communication perspective, kind of enabling services that can answer these questions. And we can only answer these questions, and I'm coming back to that at, at the end of the, of the slides, if we basically have the right bits and pieces available um, in, in the system. But let's go back and, you know, really some very simple examples of, of, of what we do. Nokia um, rolled out kind of global mapping into um, smartphones um, a couple of years ago. We have maps available offline, by the way, without data communication in, in more than 190 countries. We put turn-by-turn -turn car navigation into um, mobile devices in, um, you know, 90-plus countries um, worldwide. So we're basically trying to give people exactly that type of mobility um, on the devices that they have in their, in their pocket. And now we're looking into kind of can we do the same for public transport? Can we enable people to give the best possible experience to access public transport information while they're on the go? Just imagine we take the display that, you know, in, in, in developed countries is hanging at the train station and we put it in the pocket of the people so you don't have to walk to the train station to see where, 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 um, when the train is leaving. And you actually can look at it while you're having a coffee in the morning um, with, with your family. That's one example. The other example is we're thinking through um, a simple NFC-based ticketing trialing with um, um, you know, MTA and Long Island Railroad, um, you know, f dividing basically payments and ticketing to make sure we can integrate the access to the train stations into, into the experience in a, in, a very, uh, in a very seamless way. And there's a lot of mobile technology, of course, in, in, involved in, in that. But if we look kind of back and say, what, what, is the, what is the world looking like and what do we see basically in front of us? Um, you know, there's a couple of bullet points that I put up that I think is interesting or are interesting for us to look at. One is, you know, the convergence of communication and transportation. 
both together make up mo mobility in, in, in our days. The access to information about the real world. Yes, we're indexing the world, virtual world. We're indexing basically what is sitting on website, but we need to index the real world. We need to understand the real world to give the same level of service that you know search on the web can give you um, a search about the real world you know might might be might be giving you and we need activity data we need to understand how our world how our transport systems how our roads are being used because from that we can make it better and we can make the service better and um, already mentioned um, the you know engaging communities this is our world that we build it you know, we need to inform people how to use it. We need to learn um, from them how they use it. And I think one way that, you know, we, we see out there that, you know, communities can be very engaged in helping shaping that. And of course, there's technologies such as NFC, online cloud and connectivity that help us actually building these great services. And nobody can do it alone. It needs to be an ecosystem of partners um, to actually shape that and create that next phase of, of mobility. Okay, then let me go straight to one possible partner, which uh, in that case would be a, a rail operator, Mr. Uh, Higashi, Director of the International Department, East Japan Railway Company. <laughs> and um, Moving from smartphones to smart card ticketing, because Japan Railways introduced smart card ticketing back in 2001. Uh, it launched the Suica. Um, it would be interesting for us to know what, what the benefits have been, uh, what the limitations and what current challenges you're facing at the moment. I would like to make a, a presentation by the Japanese. So, could you uh, take a head, 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 headset, please? headset. So, please use the headsets. And since I have more ease speaking in Japanese, I'd like to make a presentation in Japanese. Well, Suica was introduced uh, since 2001 in the Tokyo metropolitan area. In Tokyo, overall, we have 14 million users who utilize railway systems. And most of these railway users in Tokyo metropolitan area utilize either smart cards or smart their smartphones to access the service, the railway services. So it's a very user-friendly service. My presentation today that I preferred is about information display. So I'd like to gradually shift my, present, uh, my talk to talk about information display as well. Well, first of all, I'd like to talk a bit about my company. The JR East um, covers this green area in the, the map of Japan. We also operate high-speed railways, but our core of our business is the operation of urban commuter rails in Tokyo metropolitan area. As I said, we have 17 million approximately of passengers uh, who utilize our services. So as I said, Tokyo uh, is an um, area where the uh, public transportation system is most developed in the world. And the share by mode of railways in 50, the Tokyo area is near 60%. Uh, we have the, the JR East, my company, as well as Tokyo Metro and other private railway companies who compete with each other but who cooperate with each other to provide seamless railway transport service. And in that sense, we are working on two areas mostly. First undertaking is the, um, the through operation of uh, railway system. The, uh, the suburban railways are connected seamlessly to the metropolitan uh, subway system. So that's one undertaking. And the second undertaking I'd like to introduce is the smart card um, usage that was already mentioned. And already um, there are 50 millions of cards that are issued at this day. In terms of information provisioning, we undertook some an an analysis of our status. Every year, our company undertakes a customer satisfaction survey. And if you look at this chart here, um, 
the lower part of this chart shows the influences of total, total satisfaction of the customers of JR East. And we learned from this customer satisfaction survey that the greatest source of dissatisfaction for customers is the fact that the necessary information are not provided in a satisfactory manner in case of accidents or delays. And the customers, we learned, are hoping that we provide information on network-wide uh, services, not only our, comp our company services. And they also would like the service to be provided at their home or at their offices. And they also would like um, information on alternative routes for example. And so, therefore, uh, we learned about the customer situations. And also, uh, we realized that we need to overcome two challenges in order to solve this. For, um, for one was that uh, we need to obtain the information of other companies' services. And secondly, uh, we learned that um, we needed to come up with a solution to provide the information in an easy-to-understand manner. So in terms of the solution to the challenge number one, uh, we have established a new um, train service information center that can provide seamless information of the network-wide services. Uh, second thing we did is the, we started providing information um, that, that are text-based and not voice-based. We created a new system, new software, that can convert the information to text-based information. And this information, text-based information, is provided to, um, through internet to the customers, and also they are provided to the large display at stations and within the trains. And in case of accidents, for example, we have two flows of information now. The one flow of information is the traditional route of information that is provided from the, um, the train management center to the trains and the train operators, and this, as well as the station. This is the tra uh, tr traditional route of information. The second additional flow of information is the information directly to the customers using internet and also displaced at stations and in trains. Uh, a little bit about the information provisioning based on text space. Well, by converting the information on text space information, we can provide the information more widely than previously. And we were therefore able to dis provide information in a more seamless manner. And we also started providing information in a map form, which is much more easier to understand for our customers. And so in terms of the, um, the information literacy, we believe that we were able to solve our problem and provide information that is easily understood by more people. We, we have much solutions and numerous solutions in terms of ITC and how we provide information to our customers. Um, but I think we be, our success in this uh, case here is really thanks to a cooperation between the industry, the companies like us, and the government. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you, Mr. Higashi. Now, information service, obviously a very important factor to seamless transport. Um, Mr. Yongwook Park, Vice President, Smart Card Company, Korea, um, you have been thinking for six years, you and your colleagues, um, about the right way, the right tool uh, that would allow borderless travel. What, and with borderless travel, I mean outside of Korea as well. So there are people from other parts of the world within your region in uh, East Asia uh, can travel without problems. How, what, 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 what were the considerations in finding the result that you will tell us about now? Uh, I think uh, before answering to your questions, I have to explain a, a bit of uh, what is ECOPS and uh, and the uh, I guess I mean ECOPS uh, stands for East Asia Common Payment Scheme. So uh, 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 it is. It has been this kind of a friendly association uh, for transit card issuers uh, for major cities in East Asia. So members are Octopus in Hong Kong, 
and EasyLink in Singapore, and Timani in Seoul, and Srutu Kansai in Osaka area. Uh, in the initial period, our associations, we, uh, our hope was that uh, someday, not in the fu near future, someday, we would have uh, some form of uh, common payment scheme. And we uh, even we started calling it Glopas. And, and we thought we could jointly issue common payment scheme, the Glopas, uh, in all of the four cities at the same time. Furthermore, uh, we, could, we could jointly issue a common payment scheme for all the public system, public transportation system in major cities in the world. Uh, we started that discussion even uh, since uh, six years back. Even though we, uh, we frequently, we had a meeting uh, frequently, but we could not go anywhere. Um, while we are discussing about the, this interoperability and common payment scheme, we finally re realized that uh, there were so many obstacles and issues to get over to finally reach our hope. Um, so, we uh, decided to forget about uh, that common payment scheme, the GLOPAS, were temporarily instead for interoperability and cross-border interoperability and seamless travel. We have to think about other solutions, other options. And so um, among many uh, solutions and options, the TSM model for NFC function is most we decide that model is most suitable for our cases. So uh, in this model, uh, we uh, uh, have to have, uh, through this, uh, 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 this model, that the focus was that our focus is that um, our customer, I mean foreign customer, foreign visitor, can download the local application, I mean a transit card application, into his or her own NFC mobile phone. Uh, to have that kind of a service, we have to uh, have, we think we have to have uh, Common mobile, common mobile channels uh, through which our customer can uh, download that local uh, transit card application into his mobile phone. But without that common mobile channel, we can imagine there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot, lots of uh, uh, technical coordination and business contract between telephone companies and transit card companies. So uh, the picture on the, on the right side, it must be a right side, right? <laughs> Shows that the complexity of those business uh, structure and, uh, and uh, required uh, correspondence between the companies. So we think GlobePass can be uh, the uh, common mobile channel through which our customer can use in the foreign territory, use their mobile phone uh, as a media for payment in public uh, systems. For example, Korean visitor in Singapore can make access to the Globe Pass and download EasyLink application into his mobile phone and can use it throughout the whole Singapore area. 
in these cities, which, which I mentioned, the four cities, the transit application, transit card application, not just only for the transit purpose only, it can be used in almost all stores in those cities. So uh, we think Glopass can provide the service to, uh, 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 to the uh, customers of uh, all four cities at the same time. We believe that we might have a chance, better chance to uh, provide this service all, uh, all the cities and for the public uh, transportation operations. Uh, we, uh, we are expecting that we're going to open, we're going to open this uh, service between uh, Singapore and Korea first uh, by end of this year, most probably uh, this coming July. Then we are expecting that more of the, the major city card operators, transit card operator, will join this program. I can say I can expect uh, this kind of business. I mean, TSM service for public transportations will come more. I mean, in the public transportation segment, we are expecting more of this kind of service. And based on this, we can create a better service in public transportation at the same time. We might have, we might, we will we, we, we have a strong chance that we have a good business in this area, and at the same time, we can increase the convenience to our customers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Verity, Chief Advisor, ITSO Limited UK. What we've just heard about Glopas, um, will you keep a good eye on this? I mean, it hasn't, it's not yet up and running, but probably by the end of the year or next year, we will have some data and find out if this is any good, if it works the way it should. Uh, is that a feasible idea for the UK and uh, cross-border travel in Europe? Well, I'm looking uh, very much towards the European context here, um, as well as uh, my own organisation, which comes from the UK. But I'm really sort of hearing through the presentations that have gone so far this afternoon, um, three themes. There's a, there's a theme which is predominantly aspirational, saying, let's see if we can start to use the new technology of mobile phones to start to bring together how we plan our journeys, how we, uh, we go through those journeys, pick up real-time information, change our plans. Uh, and there's the theme which is there that smart cards have certainly delivered some very major uh, improvements to the way ticketing has been done over the last few years. Uh, what's been happening in uh, South America, what's been happening in Europe, and so on. But actually, at the end of the day, um, when we come to something the size of Europe, is that we have a very fragmented market of many, many different schemes, all working independently of each other. And what we've been trying to look at over the last uh, five or six years is whether there actually is um, a set of common drivers which um, are there behind what we're trying to achieve with smart ticketing. Um, the one thing we have found, though, is that uh, payment, which has been mentioned a couple of times now, is not the same as ticketing, and ticketing is not the same as payment. Uh, there are many journeys which are undertaken which don't involve any payment whatsoever. Um, I'm lucky enough because of my age that I can travel free of charge on buses in the, uh, the United Kingdom. There's no payment involved there, but I do have to have some form of permission to travel, and that is a smart card. So what we've been looking at is um, what are those drivers? Is it just mobility we're looking for? Is it about social inclusion? Um, but there are also a lot of other drivers which are coming from the public transport uh, authority side, and these are things like common procurement, um, standardization, scale economics, harmonization, and so on. And to make public transport approachable to the customer at the end of the day, we've got to make the barriers that lie between us uh, almost disappear if we possibly can. We need interoperability. We've got to have interoperability at the local level, and that's what we've been hearing about as being uh, delivered in, in Korea, uh, within um, Hong Kong, it's there within the United Kingdom, it's there within Germany, and so on. But we've got to start moving that 
from the local schemes to the national schemes, and now start to move it forward uh, to the international level. And it's through that that we've really been coming together as, um, as a group of individuals representing our national schemes that are being developed in France, uh, called AFIMB, uh, within the United Kingdom, which is my own organization called ITSO, uh, and within, uh, within Germany, which is Vau de Vau. And seeing whether actually we're all talking about the same thing at the end of the day, and is there an opportunity to cooperate but the first thing we've spotted is there are actually three types of smart ticketing. And this is where we have to start to bring together this payment issue. Um, there is the traditional ticket, the permission to travel that you get in advance of making your journey. But there is a second option which is coming up now, which is prepayment. Simply being able to make a small payment to enter a metro system and then make that journey. There's not really a ticket associated with that. It's just simply a prepayment to get onto a bus line, a metro line, or whatever. And that's uh, uh, fairly common now in, in a number of US cities uh, and elsewhere. But the third option, which is only now beginning to surface, and, and London's probably the best example of it, is looking to postpayment of saying, have you got an identity which I, as a transport operator, can trust? And that's a new word that's coming into the, uh, uh, into the vocabulary. Can I trust that identity? Can I trust that smart card, that mobile phone, whatever it is, to allow you into the system, to track the way that you're traveling, and then at the end of the day, decide whether it's possible to make a, uh, a, a reversal, to go back to your bank, or if it was a bank card, uh, to, uh, to some stored value if it's uh, on that uh, identity, on that smart card, and then draw that money out. Because at the end of the day, public transport needs to be paid for. Um, it's all very well being aspirational of encouraging people to use public transport, but it's got to be paid for at the end of the day. And we've come together under the auspices of the UITP, which is the International Association for Public Transport, to uh, look towards a memorandum of understanding, and that was signed in February this year. And we're now starting to take it onto the next stage. So we're looking to what's happening in Korea uh, and the cooperation that's taking place in Southeast Asia. We're looking to other models as well. But we're also looking to build our own model so that we can build a level of cooperation across Europe that is going to deliver smart ticketing in a way which suits both the operators and also the, uh, the consumer the person we're trying to encourage into lower carbon forms of transport. Well, thank you. I found the, I um, would like to pick up on the, on the trust issue, but from the other side, so it's not the operator, can the operator trust uh, the traveler, but can the traveler trust uh, Indeed. Uh, the operator or uh, be it the, the, the mobile operator or the transport operator uh, by sharing uh, so much data, because uh, whether it's the smart card, whether it's the mobile phone, the smartphone, uh, there's an awful lot of data that goes out there, be it uh, me downloading maybe an application that allows me to be up to date on uh, bus schedules. In that moment, I also uh, share information with, uh, yeah, with whom, big question mark, uh, that, that I intend to take this bus. Do I want to share this? And what happens with this information? What about data security? Uh, Mr. Belcher, I mean, what is, what is your take on that? How can that be controlled? Well, I, I have two answers. I have my glib answer, and then I have a more serious answer. And my glib answer is, um, how many of you have one of these in your pockets, and you use it, uh, you use it for as a GPS to, to see where you're trying to get to? At that point, you, you're giving that data up, that privacy expectation. Um, that's the glib answer. Um, maybe even a second glib answer is, um, is that our expectations of privacy are changing every day. Um, we want to be connected. And part of being connected is sharing data about where you are, what your likes are, and what your, and what your needs are. And that comes with benefits. And, um, and so, the, the, the probably more practical answer is that there are ways to handle the privacy issues. We've got lots of experience doing it 
uh, again, companies like uh, cell phone companies, companies like tolling companies, bank card companies regularly manage large amounts of, of public personal data, and they have there are protections in place uh, to protect the, the the use of that data and. And we have systems which allow you to opt in, to choose whether to, to share your data. And again, when you share your data, there are benefits that come on the backside. So I, I think it's a little bit of a red herring. I think people care very much about it, but I'm not sure that they really fully appreciate how much of their privacy they've already given away. Okay, but it, it, it sort of also means that if, if I aim towards seamless travel, I may have to give up some of my privacy. I can't have my cake and eat it. I think that's right. Um, in terms of, of, of smartphones and all this technology that is moving so incredibly fast, um, what about, uh, coming back to the, to the age remark earlier, um, but even at a younger age, people that are just less tech savvy, I mean, we're all very busy in our lives, do we actually, as the consumer, I'm talking about the end consumer, uh, are we capable of keeping up? Uh, is that being taken into account by the uh, operators, uh, by the people who develop all these technologies, that the end consumer might, might be lost already, or certainly as technology keeps uh, developing, which obviously hinders us making use of it, uh, if it doesn't do it already to a certain extent? So I think, you know, we, especially the mobile industry, learned a lot within the last 10 years. Um, it, is, it is not that much about technology, kind of cramping technology into devices and talking about the technology. It's about what do we do with that, with that technology. And I think um, there was a big, big shift in the mobile industry. And um, there was a shift in even in very simple things like, you know, web services early on. You know, people talked of Web 2.0, where they simplified kind of websites, made, make, made them more clean and more clear. And I think there's a lot of attention um, that's being paid now. When I, you know, from, from my own projects, talking about Nokia Transit, the, the, the application um, Nokia builds to kind of, you know, give transportation information to, to, to people on the devices. Um, we started very early. We started actually in Germany and Berlin with, you know, working, working with um, the regional um, uh, consortium and, you know, gave timetable and real-time information. And the, 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 the feedback we got from the consumers out there was just absolutely great. It was one of the best applications we ever, we ever had because we focused so much on everyday use. We made it so simple to kind of access the information, to access information that you, you need to use every day. You're most likely traveling, you know, every day the same route or a couple of options you have, you know, from home to work. So we're really looking into kind of making this easy um, and, and making it very, very simple. So I think there is a lot of attention that's being paid and we all need to be aware of, you know, whenever we have a piece of new technology and opportunity, you know, to do it in the right way, not to, to kind of just pile it on top of what we have. By the way, if, if you would like to uh, join us up here, uh, you're more than welcome. I just need to get a sign so that I know that you would like to contribute a question or a remark. There is a gentleman. Do you see the microphone to, to your right? If you just would go to the microphone, then we can hear you. Thank you. I would like to make a comment on, on the same point. I, I think this is a, what we call the killer application. As long as you produce an application that people use, it doesn't really matter if you're old or not, because it becomes part of you. And, and it's amazing the use of the SMS to, to know how far is the bus from the stop, uh, which is something that people would not use mm. now that they they know that the information is right, that they know that it, it, it gives value to, to their daily lives, they move to that application. So it, it really much depends on, on if you're producing the application that people need, and then they start using it very fast. Because you just mentioned that, just bear with me a second, because <laughs> uh, you just mentioned the text message information about uh, bus schedule, and you actually in Chile, you uh, struck a deal with the mobile phone operator that they would not charge Yes. For the service, for um, the for the two first messages. How did you do that? Well, it was uh, 
I would say some social responsibility from the companies, but they, they thought that if the two first mes messages were free, they would create a market and they, they, that would start people using it. But on top of that, uh, smartphones have many technologies that are applications that are being used, like uh, how long it will take, which is uh, 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 an application that shows how long it's for the next past two years stop. The, the, the cell phone sees where you are, which are the closest stops to, to your location, and you uh, take that, that bus stop and tells you how long it takes for the next bus to come. So it's very smart. And really, if you, if you need it, you learn to use it. Okay. So it creates also a good image. Uh, have we lost the gentleman, or is no, he's still there? Thank you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> That's okay. Um, not being quite old enough to have a bus pass, but being old enough to still have an old Nokia phone, which I just about know how to use in terms of making phone calls. One of the things that really bugs me is I'm all in favour of some form of electronic payment or touching something in when you go in so somebody knows where I am. But I carry so many cards around with me. One of the things I invariably have with me is my bank card. So the, the discussion I thought I heard being said there was a possibility to use a bank card. And I guess in most countries throughout Europe, the equivalent of a bank card exists. And I just wonder whether we are in danger here of developing different things in different parts of the world, rather than putting all our energy into focusing on one thing, which in my case, I would suggest a bank card. What would the panel like to say to that? Shall I start uh, the response? Please. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, bank cards are remarkably common in most people. But there are parts of society which are unable to access banking. And we mustn't introduce levels of social exclusion uh, by simply saying bank cards suit 80% of, of travelers. Therefore, we'll simply go with that as the only solution. Um, we are looking very closely at, uh, at, at what you're talking about here. When I go to that form of uh, smart ticketing, which I called prepayment or uh, postpayment, which is primarily used on metro systems, uh, bus lines, and so on, then yes, you're absolutely right. That should be the way forward. If we have a contactless bank card and it's simply being used to prepay, then nothing's been written back to the card and therefore it can be used uh, and anybody should be able to enter that system if they have a banking card which has money on it uh, and is, is able to start that journey. If we're going to load a ticket to it and that's remembering that um, as soon as you start to go on to national rail systems you're not generally buying tickets which fall within the 15 or 20 euro limit that would be placed upon a contactless uh, payment. You're talking about journeys which may cost a lot more than that, then you're going to have to write a ticket back to that, um, to that smart card. The other problem we've got is that if you're doing a journey which starts on a bus, then goes on to a national rail line, you then go back to a bus again, or maybe you change country, then it's very unlikely and indeed very difficult that there would be a single ticket which would cover all of those elements of the journey. Uh, that would be very nice, but it also implies an enormously complicated settlement process afterwards. Where we have a sort of halfway stage is the ability to buy all the tickets that are necessary for your journey using that form of payment which you've got, your contactless bank card. And in which case you then need to collect effectively a wallet of tickets. Um, and that takes up more space than the banks have so far been uh, willing to to offer on those contactless bank cards. But it's a, it's a discussion, it's a commercial discussion at the end of the day. And our hope is, particularly in Europe, with the development of multi-application bank cards, which have a lot more space on them, that we're going to get into that situation where ticketing is not payment, payment is not ticketing, but where you want the two together, then you're able to use a wallet effectively to hold all of the tickets necessary for that journey. And all of this integration that we've sort of been talking about here, that's where the smartphone starts to say, well, I can take you to a site which will do the journey planning, 
Yes, we've reached that stage already. A to B, journey planning can be done. The next stage on is then deciding what tickets do I need for that journey? Can I buy them? Can I load them onto that place? But the one thing we don't want is, as you rightly say, you then having to carry, as you do with paper tickets at the moment, a vast wadge of different uh, uh, vouchers for each part of that journey, uh, all on separate pieces of paper. And that's what we're talking about within the, uh, what's called the IFM Alliance, the Interoperable Firm Management, let's call it Smart Ticketing Alliance, um, as how we can come together and hold all in one place all of the necessary tickets. And that's all about standardization. It's about um, negotiations with the, the owner of the card that you're going to load it on the mobile phone operator if it's a mobile phone. But it's starting, those discussions are starting. And yes, we are working uh, and do very much see what you have just been talking about, the ability to pay for a journey and have all the necessary bits of that journey held in one place rather than on a whole series of different cards, mobile phones or whatever. Uh, just give me a, just a second, I have just one uh, follow-up in that context, because uh, you just mentioned that uh, it's highly unlikely, at least in the foreseeable future, to sort of have one ticket or one card for uh, various stages of your journey. And on EU level, I believe there's a group which is called Interoperable Fair Management, which develops a set of technology specifications yes. to allow exactly, uh, exactly that, uh, a single card uh, to host multiple ticketing systems, it is multiple hopefully also cross-border. Yeah. So is, is that the right direction? Is it that is, is that yes. feasible, yes. what they're doing? Yes, it's, it's the ability to hold all of the tickets you need for a journey rather than one ticket for the whole journey. Uh, the one ticket from any destination to any destination anywhere in Europe is a massive effort to create and it has a massive back office of all the settlement and uh, there's an enormous amount of trust, for instance, between the operators as well. But the ability to hold all the different tickets all in one place, that's achievable and that's what we're trying to achieve. Okay. Yep. Mr. Higashi. In terms of the Japanese experience, I'd like to co make some comments. Please use the headphones for the interpretation. Well, there has been comments about using one single bank card uh, for the settlements of in different areas and using different railways. And I think that's a great thing. And that's something that we are also considering. But to give an example of Japan, 10 years ago, we started the smart card systems in transportation. And there are two different solutions. One uh, uh, card which doesn't have any any name, and another card that has uh, that your name printed on. But the most popular of the card is the one that has that doesn't have any name on it. So as long as you pay about five dollars, um, you can obtain this card. Anyone can obtain the card, even non-Japanese people, and um, you can util immediately start using the card. So for customers, um, this increases the options they have at hand. So that is, in a way, increasing the customer satisfaction. And so I think that is what uh, we have to keep in mind when we think about using a bank card as a transportation card. In Japan, most of the mobile phone users, actually 50 uh, 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 are now smart card, uh, smartphone users, excuse me. And I believe that in the very near future, uh, majority of the Japanese mobile phone users will be using smartphones. And with smartphones, there are various options available to us. For example, you just vis you're visiting Tokyo for the first time, you don't know about Tokyo as well. Well, uh, if it's using your smartphones, you can access the transportation system there immediately, and you can obtain necessary information, what has been impossible so far can be possible using smartphones. Mr. Belcher, yeah. Just two, uh, two, two quick uh, comments. Um, first of all, in, um, in, 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 in various parts of Europe, in cities, in, in cities within uh, the United States and within Latin America, you are moving towards a system in which you've got one card for multiple transport systems. Um, we've got the Oyster card. We have a number of cards, so you can pay for uh, bus, you can pay for train, you can pay for parking, you can pay for, for, uh, for, um, um, uh, for ferries all on one card. So we are moving in that direction. And I think um, I'm, always, I'm, I'm, I'm generally the optimist, and, the, and so I think we will get to the point where you'll be able to do it um, 
based on a credit card because where the business case is now for credit cards, where they're competing is on micropayments. The big impediment to this in the past had been the, the, the transactions were too small. Well, now as that's where uh, bank card companies are competing. So I think there's a business incentive to drive it as well as a, as well as a, um, as, as well as a, um, a user incentive driving it. So I think it's a little bit of both. I think we will definitely get there. Mr. Park. I just want to add one thing to uh, John's remark about that uh, not single application for all the trouble. Instead, multiple application can be kept in a card and can be, can be used in almost everywhere. That's the idea why we uh, failed for six years in for interoperability among cities, cross-border interoperability. So we decide to move to the TSM model. That's why uh, we uh, decide to go that direction. So instead of a single application, which is, can be applied to all cities, we, we uh, select the TSM model. We can let the our customer can use the local application everywhere in, with their single phone. That's the same idea that we uh, share here. Okay. Have I overlooked anybody? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Carey, and I'm a journalist from Melbourne in Australia. Um, my question is regarding smart cards. Melbourne is in the latter stages at the moment of introducing a smart card for all travel and completely phasing out the old paper tickets. Um, this implementation, it has had some teething problems, to put it mildly. In fact, you could maybe call it a bit of a trans Santiago, to be honest. Um, how I, I'm just keen for any insights that people can provide from cities that are a bit further along the track than Melbourne is. How important is it to have a system for short-term visitors that is very easy to use and that is instantaneous and that doesn't inconvenience um, travellers or leave them short of out of pocket or short of make them pay you know more than they should be paying and have any of the cities any of the systems you have worked on had these problems in the early stages and if so what did you do to identify and fix those problems thank you all right, who feels, Mr. Igashi? Okay, headsets. Well, smart cards. Well, it was Hong Kong actually uh, that introduced a large scale smart cards in the world. And as I said, in Japan, we in Tokyo, we've introduced this 10 years ago. And we were thinking about and have had many discussions about enabling the foreign visitors to use it. So if we can receive a small amount of deposit, not too high an amount, but a small amount of deposit, we can provide this IC card immediately. For example, if a visitor arrives in the Narita airport from abroad, they can pay about 10 euros, for example, and with 10 euros deposit, we can provide this IC card so that the customers can utilize immediately their card to access the city, for example. So it's important that we do not set a special requirement for them. So in that sense, children can have their IC card and someone who's bankrupt can also access train transportation. So in public transportation, what's important is diversity. That's a very important element. And so that is why it, uh, we believe that it's extremely important that foreign visitors, for example, can access our solution. Uh, Mr. Verite, the, the uh, London uh, transport um, Transport for London, that's the correct one, is, is currently undergoing a, a system change for the Oyster card. Is that perhaps also something, because as far as I know, as a, as a short-term visitor, it is very difficult to, to benefit from the uh, current Oyster card. So is, is, is it going in that direction, what you're changing uh, to? Yes, London is, uh, is picking up on that uh, post-payment option that I, I was talking about which is where um, you have a contactless bank card. On arrival in London, that card will be read and um, trusted for the rest of your journeys in, in London. 
uh, until overnight, they will then look to your bank to reimburse the cost of that uh, or the journeys, because it's multiple journeys that you may well be making during that time. So that is an alternative option to the traditional smart card. And smart cards are actually dropping in price. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, you uh, can, in some parts of the country, actually get your smart card, which is simply a paper ticket uh, with a chip embedded in it. So much cheaper, uh, much more disposable. The, uh, the other thing, though, that will come will be the option of using your mobile phone. But that really leads to probably part of the other answer to the question about Melbourne, and that is the importance of, of standards, standards and specifications. Um, the International Standards Organization has done a lot of work on defining uh, the standards for smart card use in transportation, uh, picking up both at the, uh, the technical level of the, uh, the radio frequency that will uh, flow um, miraculously between the smart card and the, the gate or the ticket machine or whatever that you're using. But you also need, and this is a big issue for us in Europe, definitions of both what you're talking about, the language of smart cards, um, and at the next level down, what an application looks like, uh, what sort of operating systems you will allow on the cards, and all of that needs to be defined to a point where there is no misunderstanding uh, between one organization and the other. There is a lot of trust, and this word is, is coming up time and time again. There is a lot of trust in the standards uh, that uh, are used in smart card ticketing uh, in public transport, which needs to be underpinned by the bodies such as the International Standards Organization which are responsible for those standards. And more and more people are getting involved. We uh, are involved both at the national level, at the European level, and at the international level to make sure that, yes, we don't fall into the problems that have befallen a number of smart card schemes around the world on implementation. If it wasn't specified enough, then somebody will find that variability in that specification and will, unfortunately, make the system not work as a result of that. But yes, London has gone to the route of multiple ways of actually entering the system and using it. Um, but uh, we also need to make sure that multiple types of cars, multiple types of equipment are all interoperable within a single scheme as well. Okay, before I ask the gentleman to ask his question or comment, whatever it is, I just wanted to uh, ask Mr. Brenner, I've noticed that uh, when we do have questions here, and even up here on uh, on the podium, uh, the emphasis seems to be the smart card as opposed to, to the smartphone as a means to cross-border travel. And um, could it have something to do with uh, operators fearing possible information transaction costs? Uh, do they not trust the uh, smartphone as a tool? How, how do you explain that? So. I would even go one step back and abstract from, you know, whatever device or whatever, you know, um, um, piece you're using um, that replaces the ticket and basically ask very, a very simple question. What was a paper ticket? You know, paper ticket was something that enabled me to use the system, right? It, it's something that has been, you know, was validated when I entered the system. It had a fare attached to it. There was some process of controlling the fare so I don't kind of you know run you know on the train longer than I actually paid for or um, it's it was a very very simple system um, there was a second piece and you know coming back to de decoupling a little bit the problem with which is I needed a method to get the ticket right I needed to pay for it and the method to get a ticket was maybe a counter there was multiple payment options maybe a card maybe cash maybe a subscription, what, 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 whatever, right? And I think what is really important when we start using new technologies to make sure we basically don't, we don't establish more complex systems than we actually need. What we need is we still need the very simple validation. We still need a fare attached to a ticket, you know, used to be a piece of paper, um, you know, it should be very effective, efficient, because people don't want to line up, they don't want to wait to open the gates, they want to use the train, they want to pay for it. 
The second thing we need is, um, of course, a payment. And, you know, with online payments, with, you know, electronic banking, with, you know, other payment services, um, you know, coming up, there's new options to pay. But that shouldn't complicate it creating the ticketing process, right? Because we don't, we, don't, we don't need it there. We can introduce new fares, we can introduce post-payment after using the ticket, which, which still the ticket is the same, right? You use it, you collect some more information about the ticket, and then you, you pay later on. So from our point of view, I think we need to make sure that um, whatever we establish is, is effective and cost-efficient. Um, you know, trust zones, different applications from different operators, interoperability, is a really, really tough problem. And I, I can tell you from the mobile industry, we know what this means. You know, mobile phones running in every single country in the world. And um, so th I just want to create or raise the awareness of, you know, let's always ask ourselves, you know, do we have a simpler system? And I think what, we are, what we're talking about um, in, in our ticketing approach is, is really decoupling things, really looking at a very simple, um, uh, uh, model where you know a ticket ID similar to a paper ticket you know is being used to enter the station to validate the fare to attach a fare to the ticket and completely decouple the payment system um, from it because there's different options in different regions on different phones with different operators that can all be solved but you know I'm just you know a, 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 when we start mixing things, I think it becomes very expensive because new applications, updates for applications need to be paid for, they need to be trusted, you know, getting into trust zones. So I, I just want to create the awareness that new technology, it's the same thing we talked about before, right? When we introduce new technologies to, you know, to consumers, we need to make sure it's simple, it's easy, and it's cost efficient as well. Okay, keep it simple then is the motto here. Please. I'm Michael Rose. I'm from Los Angeles. We do not have a seamless transport system in Los Angeles. It's very seamed and maybe chasms, basically. And public transportation is just dreadful in Los Angeles. And private transportation is gridlock. So I, I'm not quite sure it's really a transportation system or really just uh, an, a parking lot. But looking at the smart card, which is, would be great if we actually had a really wonderful public transportation system, but the people who are using public transportation generally in Los Angeles are seen as have-nots. And I'm wondering if looking at technology creates additional barriers to people who may not actually have an income that would allow them to have the newest technology. Are there ways to incorporate within the new technology some legacy technology so people aren't left at the curb. Okay, that we don't create uh, sort of some uh, parallel societies in, in, in public transport. Mr. Belcher, perhaps you would like to start there. Having grown up in Southern California, I feel your pain. Yeah. Um, it, it, there are a couple of different levels uh, to, to the answer. Um, one, um, Interestingly, if you start to look at the statistics of phone ownership and smartphone ownership um, in, in the United States, but also in the developing world, it's really remarkably high. People have phones now before they, that, that's their first and major, um, major discretionary purchase. And so I think, um, I think that there's that. Um, then as we start to, one of the things is you talk about data, um, Making data available, can, it can be made available in a multitude of different ways so that people who, who don't have the same access can still get better information. So you can get real-time next bus information not only on your phone, but also at the bus stop on a variable message sign, for example. Because that would be very important in Los Angeles, because right now, many of the bus stops, there is absolutely no information available. And I know I, I'll be walking down the street, someone from Germany might be there visiting, wondering why there's a bus stop with no information, and they ask me, where's, when, and where is the next bus? And it's really frustrating. But, but also, with, even though people have phones, would those necessarily be smartphones? Would those necessarily be phones that would have that kind of capability, even though they may have phones? 
I mean, phones are ubiquitous, but they may not necessarily be iPhones. Before I hand it over to somebody else, can I just uh, make one request? Um, write an article about um, about the lack of infrastructure funding in 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 California and and across the country. It's very difficult for for Caltrans. It's very difficult for LA uh, to to raise the funds that are necessary to be able to maintain the infrastructure they have and to provide that kind of information to the users. Um, we're in a we're in a funding crisis uh, worldwide, but particularly in North America right now. And and um, you could do the most good by by continuing to raise that awareness with the voters in in uh, in California and in the United States. So that uh, now I'll, uh, yeah. I'll brings take, us to the authorities. Huh? Um, I have uh, uh, some comment to uh, Mr. Tom Brenner's uh, argument about the simplicity. The simplicity. Uh, Okay, uh, uh, in customer sites, um, viewpoints, simplicity might be uh, the post payment. Okay, maybe uh, that the collector side and data processing side might be a uh, burden uh, to handle post payment. Still, my market and Seoul market is open to a post payment, a pre payment, and everything is mobile and everything. But 65% people are prepared to use post-payment card instead of prepaid card, even though my company issue prepaid card. So post-payment is more popular to the customer, our customer. So that part of the simplicity should be considered more. Yeah. We had two things addressed. For one, the authorities, and I won't let you uh, off the hook in that respect, but also uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, S smartphones is any kind of phone uh, compatible, for example, to receive all the information and the necessary service required in order, for example, uh, using public transport in a wonderful city like Los Angeles? So I think that, that, that there's a few different things. Um, one thing is receiving information of the system, right? I think, you know, phones becoming smarter and smarter and even you know, the, the, the lower tier phones, you know, become quite, um, quite powerful. So Nokia offers um, a whole range of devices for emerging um, uh, countries with, you know, very, very low cost data access, um, where basically we're crunching down the data on the other side of, of, of the line. And yes, and, you know, there you can use, and even SMS, you know, text-based information systems um, can, can be built um, very effectively. Then when it comes to, to ticketing, of course, you know, the system needs to be open to, to use kind of, um, you know, the transport system without having the right device. Um, that, that is something that uh, we, need, we, we need to make sure. But again, the thinking of the paper ticket and this little idea, ID that we used to have to kind of, you know, use the system, that is what should be driving how we kind of set up new systems. Mr. Higashi? I, I don't so let me make some comments here. There were many important points mentioned, but regarding smart cards, well, from a considerably long time, we were thinking of introducing smart cards, but in actuality, smart cards were not penetrated. Uh, that has been the history of smart card. And, in that, and within that backdrop, the octopus card in Hong Kong and the Suica in Japan, for example, an oyster card in London were finally introduced in the past few years. And this is the killer contents here is that the usability and the ease of use for the users. And the LA, the person from the LA mentioned that how can we, about the important point of how to realize usability and ease of use and attractiveness of use from the customer's point of view. Well, in case of Japan, um, the Suica card can be utilized as an e e or e-wallet as well. The users can use the same card to use the transportation system and also go shopping in a supermarket and also use taxi, take taxi and pay with the, their card. 
So in that sense, this transportation card for the general public in Tokyo uh, is becoming a really important part of their everyday life. And that is why more and more people are uh, using and obtaining the uh, uh, Suica card. So in a way, we have a positive cycle in Tokyo. And we have been discussing also about information. And uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, we need to think about who is the generator of the information and who is willing to pay and uh, shoulder the burden of the information provision. And we need to clarify this point, uh, and otherwise we will not be able to provide the necessary information. So th the method of information provision is also very important. And in that sense, there's a very interesting episode. So in Japan, we created at the JR East, the information, um, the train information center, as I mentioned in my presentation, and on the internet and on the chat page, uh, many users are um, uploading information about train services. If, for example, if there's a delay or if there's a suspension of service somewhere for some train service in Tokyo, some users, some end users will be chatting about it immediately. So in a way, there is so much more information provided to the society at large. And in that sense, if you can use the social media and the chat, for example, chat application, maybe we can, we do not have to spend so much money to provide the necessary information for the end users and it may be even quicker. So we need to make sure that we can utilize these expertise, these experiences into the final solution that we're developing. Okay, we're almost run out of time already. Um, we started a bit late, so maybe I just add a couple of minutes if if you have the time. I, I wanted to uh, turn to Minister uh, Erasuris uh, one more time uh, because it bugs me a bit the question about infrastructure funding. And uh, on the one hand, we have these great ideas of technological possibilities with a smartphone, e-ticking and so forth. Some operators interested in one uh, version using the smart cards, others perhaps more interested in developing the smartphone uh, possibility. You have all these different kinds of travelers, more or less tech savvy. Uh, where does the role of government come into it? I mean, how do you connect all the dots and make sure that at the end you actually uh, have a seamless transport, that all parties benefit from it? The, the first thing I, I would like to say is that I, I will take Santiago people down to LA so that we, they will feel better to see that the situation in some other places is similar. But, uh, and the second thing is that cellular phones, uh, Chileans, uh, we have 22 million cellular phones and only 17 million people. So cellular phones are very, very common and everyone has them. So clearly uh, we're very, very close to, to, we were afraid when the pro project started that this could create a barrier for some people that could not get into the buses and, and users of buses are uh, all range of people. So they, we needed to get to everyone. And clearly the smart card worked very well and they really loved the card. And, and even at the beginning, they were they had fear but it 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 has proven to be very successful and i'm sure that as we go along the way for smart uh, for smartphones and cellular phones uh, it will be easy to introduce because people really like them and, and and use them we as a government had a very big involvement in the starting of the transantiago project and 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 we really think that failed in many aspects of the project. We are moving towards creating the conditions and making private companies to do their job and trying to set standards, making sure that things are usable for everyone and that the, the system that you have in one city works the same in other cities, making the conditions, but pushing them to make the changes and, and hopefully next time make the changes in, in small steps, not in one go. But, but really we feel that there is a huge work for, for uh, authorities to make sure that you have the conditions. And that is infrastructure in some cases, that, that is standards in many cases, and also pushing uh, in, uh, private investors to, to be part of the system. This is our view today. 
I look around one last time. We can either have one last question. If there's anything that you say, this topic should have been raised. Why wasn't it? Now is the moment. There's two now. Okay. Make it short. Yeah. Um, uh, Christophe Andrier, an, uh, yeah, Richtung Nokia. Uh, wie weit sind wir denn davon in my question, my question goes to Nokia. I mean, our customers, uh, they just want to reach their destination. They tell the device where they want to go. Uh, they get the information and uh, they can also use their, their Nokia phone or their iPhone to get access to the system. So we would like to have a uh, kind of convergence of the systems, just information about traffic and also buying the tickets. Translators. Also, gibt zwei Dinge. Well, first of all, I think we're on a good track. First of all, we can make information available, and that's what we do already. We, as Nokia, can communicate to the users that there are opportunities on this device. They don't have to go and buy something. They get a device that is pre-equipped and you just have to use that information system. Um, for many regions of the world, uh, Nokia devices also provide uh, information about local public transport. And we also would like to cooperate with local transport operators like MTA New York to find a simple ticketing system independent of payment, but a ticketing system that can be integrated into the mobile information system. And here we conduct trials in New York at the moment. We try to learn from these trials, these pilot phases. We try to get more transport operators on, bo on board in order to be able to develop broad-based standards and we'd like to develop a good experience for our consumers to equip our devices with these new things so that as soon as you've got your Nokia you've got your timetable uh, too so when you have your device uh, you can easily and immediately also use the tickets in order to get on the train and just go as far as payment is concerned I mean, that, huh, there we have to find a solution. Uh, it's a very complex uh, thing to do, and there are many different opportunities, and there are many uh, solutions that were de developed already. What we like to f focus on is uh, create a system that is user-friendly, easy to use, and also easy to use for the transport operators, because they have to incur costs too, and to a large degree, the costs uh, to be borne by the operator will be the cost that uh, the user has to pay for the ticket. The gentleman here in the front. Nope. First row. Oh. For uh, Tom Brenner, please. I come from a far country, the same country of the minister, Erasmus. Um, I have a question for you. When I, I travel, uh, if I want to use my uh, smartphone, it's not yours, it's my <laughs> but I want to use my smartphone, my telephone company in my country send me a, a message and send me warning, no. <laughs> uh, warning, your, your financial future is danger. What is the uh, this expensive, the technology or the service of the telephone? What do you think? How how many how how long time we have to wait for the the technology was uh, cheaper? So, um, the the answer, of course, is not simple to the, to that to that question. But I I can give you some very easy uh, you know easy to understand examples of of what we did in in Nokia, and one of the interesting points also regarding to public transport and transportation is you need to have information about the world around you. You need to know the streets, you need to know the walking distance. If I want to tell you in the morning when you should be leaving to the train station, I need to know how much time does it take for you to walk to the next train station or to a potential alternative if one bus line is not, is not running. This type of information we're already embedding in the device. We have a lot of information that we can already put on the device, we don't need connectivity. Our maps that Nokia ships in, um, um, in over 190 countries can be downloaded locally to the device, so you save money. You don't need kind of to connect and, and, and load big map data. 
Um, other information, of course, like real-time information for you know um, for the public from the public transport system, needs to be downloaded because otherwise it's not real time and it's not up to date anymore. But a lot of information is really kind of is 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 not a lot of data and we can be very efficient. And as mentioned for emerging countries, some of our phones are actually specially made to save data cost. Or we build services specially just on SMS basis, so there's no big um, um, data connectivity needed to run the services. So I think there is a couple of opportunities already out there to basically start using this. And as you know, some of the countries grow and some of the services grow and some of the technical capabilities and the infrastructure grows, like you know, more data data access, um, then you know it will become available more and more um, on a on a on a common basis. And we see that um, very heavily and very fastly growing. Not only the saturation of the devices, as as mentioned before, but also the infrastructure from the mobile network operators um, um, is is growing very fast. Okay, I believe we all had extremely high uh, mobile phone bills already and uh, when traveling, so we're, we're all used to that. Um, well, at this point, uh, I'm afraid it's a wrap. Uh, what I take from this session is uh, that uh, smartphone companies want to keep things simple, which uh, suits me very well, and that connectivity is only possible if I'm willing to give up a bit of my privacy. Um, Maybe that's a generation question, maybe that's a question of culture as well, but uh, I don't think there's a way around it. I hope you also found one or two things to take with you from this session. I would like to thank the panelists, and if you still have the strength in you, you could thank them with a round of applause for being here with us this afternoon.